Today, apocalypse postponed. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Well, no, it's post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, there's something weird afoot, and in today's review of the market action over the last week, I want to talk about it. There is much talk of falling inflation, moderating wages, record low unemployment, and possible soft landings. Yet, some on Wall Street say that 2023 will indeed likely turn ugly. Okay, we had a beautiful January for investors, but what if this is only a mirage, a stock rally that's already gone too far? Well, that's the warning from strategists at Bank of America, who said investors could face brutal declines if economic growth crumbles in the second half of the year. The risk is that inflation flares up again over the next few months, and that the US economy faces a deeper recession than that initially predicted after staying resilient in the first six months of 2023, they wrote. But with more experts seeing potential success for the Fed after a year of panicky recession calls, it may be a warning that's hard for some to heed. The most painful trade, the bank strategist wrote, is always the apocalypse postponed. Now, the traditional favourable start to financial markets in 2023 due to investor fund inflows that typically accompany the new year has been turbocharged by data pointing to a greater possibility as a soft landing for the US economy and, most recently, the signals coming out from the Federal Reserve. So, underinvested investors need to assess their willingness to lose as valuations surge ahead of the consensus view on the economic outlook, said Mohamed A. L. Arun, who is a former chief executive officer of PIMCO, president of Queen's College Cambridge, chief economic advisor at Allianz, and chair of Grimacy Fund Management. The generalised price rally, he says, has been so quick and so big for both stocks and bonds that it raises an interesting question for under-invested investors who have not yet put their money to work. What they should do? should correlate closely but not entirely to their economic and policy views. Most of the recent macroeconomic data has been better than consensus forecast. The resulting mix of declining inflation indicators and less worrisome growth developments has tipped the balance of risks somewhat more toward a soft landing and away from the hard landing characterised by a recession or stagnation. That is music to the ears of markets because it enables a mutually supportive price rally for stocks and bonds. And it's reinforced by the view that because of such economic developments, the Fed will not have to raise interest rates much higher, if at all, nor will it have to keep the elevated rates unchanged for the remainder of 2023. Indeed, the markets this week increased their expectations for rate cuts later this year, further fueling the rally in stocks and other risk assets. The resulting moves in markets are eye-popping, barely a month in the year. The S&P 500 index is up almost 9%. Internationally, European markets have done even better, with the main indices up 11% to 14%, as have emerging markets, which have gained roughly 10%. The typically more volatile assets have also soared, with the technology-heavy Nasdaq Composite Index up more than 16% and Bitcoin gaining more than 44%. Fixed income has not been left out, though, with stronger gains for the riskier and more volatile segments, such as high-yield bonds which are about 5%. This sharp, rapid and generalised rally confronts the underinvested with a delicate balance. Should they jump into the rally that has almost met quite a few analyst market forecasts for the year as a whole, or should they wait for more attractive entry points? An important part of the answer depends on their economic and policy views. Underinvested investors would be inclined to join the roaring rally if they expect economic growth and jobs to hold up, and inflation to come down solidly and consistently towards the Fed's 2% target. That is, extrapolating the favourable data from the last few months. And they'd also be betting on the macroeconomic configuration to persuade the Fed to pause interest rate increases either now or after one more hike and then cut in the second half of the year. 
In so doing, they would be discarding indicators that would favour the alternative, that of waiting for better entry points. Such indicators include still worrisome forward-looking economic data, including purchase managers' indices and layoff announcements, as well as the Fed's consistent forward policy guidance. And they'd also need to think that the central bank will not worry about the loosest overall financial conditions in a year. It's a delicate balance, to say the least. Now, Aaron says, I feel that the economic outlook may not be as smooth sailing as the markets now expect. For example, the downward path of inflation will hit a sticky patch at around 4% later this year, and that notwithstanding job vacancies outpacing unemployment by 1.9 times, the labour market risks will come under some pressure from widespread layoffs. Remember, the more companies that announce layoffs, the greater the air cover for others to join, including those looking to rebalance the skill distribution of their workers. What I have less of a feel for, he says, is the Fed's policy reaction function, especially after this week. This has become an even more important issue for the underinvestment question, given the extent to which markets have extrapolated policy outcomes well beyond what the Fed has been signalling. It is not enough for the underinvested to decide on their course of action based just on their economic and policy outlook. In today's uncertain world, they also need to consider an aspect of their personal risk preferences that some often overlook. If they end up making a mistake, which one would they be least unhappy having to live with? The good news for the underinvested is that the portion of their money that is already invested has done extremely well so far this year. Less good is the inherent difficulties they face at these higher valuations in assessing what to do with the cash on the sidelines. Ultimately, the decision will come down to their assessment of the recoverability of a possible mistake, something that even those with common economic and policy outlooks may differ on. And indeed, on Friday, major US stock indices ended lower after surprisingly strong jobs data sparked concerns about aggressive Federal Reserve action, while investors digested a mixed bag of mega cap company earnings reports. Jobs growth in the US blew past expectations in January, the latest in a series of bewilderingly strong data points from the labour markets and a strong reality check to hopes for a quick turn in the Federal Reserve's interest rate cycle. We now have another 25 basis point hike in the March FOMC, our base case, raising the peak Fed funds rate in this cycle to 4.875%, with more upside risk if labour market data continues to move from strength to strength, Morgan Stanley said, having ditched its estimate for a Fed pause next month. Treasury yields jumped as investors priced in a more hawkish Fed, with expectations nearly fully priced in, and a May hike jumping to 57.5% from 30%, which is where it was on Wednesday. The 10-year bond was at 3.519, while the two-year shot up to 4.2865, still in recession inversion territory. Now, the Labour Department said non-farm payrolls grew by 517,000 through to the middle of the month, abruptly snapping a four-month trend of slowing job gains. Analysts had expected a further slowdown to 185,000, which would have been the slowest job growth in nearly two years. And December's payroll data was also revised up by 37,000 and November's by 34,000, reinforcing the surprise in the January numbers. As such, the numbers provided further evidence that the labour market that overheated as the pandemic eased is still only slowly losing steam despite a succession of big interest rate hikes by the Fed. The idea that Fed cycle is ending sooner than the ECB or the Bank of England may be in the question, said Cathy Jones, Chief Fixed Income Strategist with Charles Schwab. Fed Chair Jerome Powell had raised hopes of a pivot later this year at his press conference when he argued that a disinflationary trend had already begun and had only pushed back mildly against the suggestions of a first cut before the end of the year. Analysts said the details of the report raised the likelihood that the Fed can achieve a soft landing for the economy rather than the recession that many fear. Average weekly hours of work rose to 34.7. That's the last in 10 months, amid anecdotal evidence of people taking more side jobs to claw back with extra earnings, the spending power that they lost to inflation last year. And average hourly earnings, meanwhile, rose only a modest 0.3%, well below the pace of gains seen earlier last year. If we were to design a report to support the Fed's immaculate disinflation narrative, 
this would probably outdo it, said Megan Green, chief economist with the Kroll Institute. But it's very important to bear this in mind because the Bureau of Labor Statistics in January used updated statistics on the U.S. population to compile its data. This led to an upward revision of 871,000 in the civilian labor force. That's an 810,000 rise in employment and a 60,000 rise in unemployment. While the jobless rate was unaffected at a historically low 3.4% of the workforce, the labor force participation rate ticked up from 623 to 62.4%. So there's a bit of number weighing going on here, and so I think we need to be cautious with these numbers. Anyway, for the week, the S&P 500 rose 1.6%, the Dow slipped 0.15%, and the Nasdaq gained 3.3%. The Nasdaq tallied its fifth straight weekly rise, its longest such streak since late 2021. The jobs report was an incredible surprise, and it raises a lot of questions about what the Fed is going to do next, said Christina Hooper, chief global market strategist at Invesco. What I think is causing some of the volatility is markets trying to make sense of how the Fed will perceive this. Another sign of economic strength, the US services industry activity rebounded strongly in January as well. So investors have been balancing hopeful signs that the economy could avoid a feared recession against concerns about how long the Fed will keep interest rates high to rein in inflation. The S&P 500 gained earlier this week after comments that were more dovish than expected from Fed Chair Jerome Powell, who acknowledged progress in the fight against inflation. Anyhow, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 0.3% to 33,925, the S&P 500 lost 1.04% to 4,136, and the Nasdaq Composite dropped 1.59% to 12,006. On Friday, investors were also digesting another heavy batch of corporate results. Shares of Apple, the largest US company by market value, rose 2.44%. The company forecast that revenue would fall for a second quarter in a row, but that iPhone sales were likely to improve as production had returned to normal in China. Gross margins are now expected to be 44% at the midpoint, and that would be the highest gross margin in over a decade as Apple's ability to further control its ecosystem through its chip production and tactical negotiation with suppliers gives the stalwart a major margin. Tailwind Wedbush said, lifting its price target on Apple to $180 from $185 a share. Shares of Amazon slumped, though, down 8.43%, as the company said operating profit would fall to zero in the current quarter, a savings from layoffs do not make up for the financial impact of consumers and cloud customers clamming down on spending. Some on Wall Street, however, pointed to improving margins in Amazon's e-commerce businesses that also likely received added boosts from recent job cuts as reasons for optimism. E-commerce margins improved quarter on quarter and should benefit from the first quarter headcount reductions, Oppenheimer said in a note as it lifted its price target on the stock to $125 from $130 a share. Online stores likely will benefit from a stronger second half on easier comps. Alphabet shares dropped 2.75% after the Google parent posted fourth quarter profits and sales short of Wall Street expectations. And in other corporate news, Ford Motors shares slid 7.6% after the automaker predicted a difficult year ahead. And in other earnings news, Starbucks delivered quarterly results that fell short of estimates on both the top and the bottom lines as the coffee chain sales in China were hurt by the COVID surge following the country's reopening. And in other news, Nordstrom surged nearly 25% as activist interest activist investor Ryan Cohen reportedly took a stake in the retailer and is eyeing board changes. Now, it's interesting that good US jobs data used to translate almost instantly to high oil prices, but not anymore. Crude prices tumbled 7% on the week, taking global benchmark Brent to below 80 US dollars per barrel and bringing WTI, or US West Texas Intermediate, to the low 70s after the sterling US jobs report for January bumped up the dollar instead, weighing on commodities. New York traded West Texas Intermediate, for March, settled down 3.49% to 73.23 a barrel as the dollar's resurgence on the same jobs report put paid to crude's initial advance on the data. For the week, the US crude benchmark was down by just over 7.5%, opening a fresh gash in oil market sentiment for February after the drop of nearly 3% in the final week of January. 
month to date. WTI was down about 7%, extending its near 9% slide over the three previous months. London traded Brent crude for March delivery settled down 2.35% to 79.82 a barrel. And for the week, the global crude benchmark was down about 7.5% after last week's near 3% loss for February. Thus far, Brent has lost 5.4%, extending its compounded 6.5% slide for January and December. Sentiment in this market is fickle, said Craig Ellum, analyst at online trading platform Onya. It clearly doesn't take too much, as we saw in early January, for investors to become euphoric, nor does it take much for them to lose their nerve. That could remain a key feature of the first quarter and ensure oil prices remain highly volatile. Oil prices have been on the back foot since a sixth straight weekly build in US crude, along with surpluses in fuel reported by the EIA, or Energy Information Administration, this week. Also weighing on the market were uncertainties over how well demand from China would fare in February, more than a month after the top crude importer abandoned all COVID restrictions. On China's side, crude imports were assessed at 10.98 million barrels per day in January, down from December's 11.37 million and November's 11.42, according to a Reuters report. Now, European equities were broadly low on Friday as investors poured over disappointing results from major tech sector players and were looking ahead to those key US job market figures, which of course surprised. The regional stock 600 ended up 0.3%. The DAX index in Germany traded 0.29% higher and the CAC 40 in France rose 0.94%. Perhaps the outlier was the FTSE 100 in the UK, which gained 1.04% to reach new highs. In European corporate news, shares in Sanofi saw their biggest loss since November after the French drug maker's fourth quarter results missed expectations due to weak demand for its vaccine division. But shares in Caxia Bank were lifted following the Spanish lender's announcement that it will consider more extraordinary capital distributions in 2024 having fallen earlier. Additionally, gold futures dipped by 2.75% to 1,878, while the euro US dollar slid 1.05% to 1.795, and the DXY rose 1.22% to 102.99 on those strong US job figures. In Asia, Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index was the worst performer for the day, falling 1.36% on losses in technology stocks. Chinese stocks sank as well after mixed economic data drummed up worries about a speedy recovery in the world's second largest economy after lifting its strict zero COVID policy. While China's services sector rebounded sharply in January after four months of declines, a private survey showed that smaller scale manufacturing businesses were still struggling in the face of rising COVID-19 cases and lingering supply chain issues. The Shanghai Composite Indices sank 0.68% after steady profit-taking this week from recently hitting multi-month highs. Chinese indices were also the worst performers in Asia this week. Mixed economic data released drummed up concerns over a speedy recovery in China after lifting off its zero COVID policy. While the country's services sector rebounded sharply in January after four months of declines, a private survey showed that smaller-scale manufacturing businesses were still struggling in the face of rising COVID-19 cases and lingering supply chain issues. Other Asian tech-heavy indices also lagged with the Taiwan weighted index up 0.1%, while South Korea's KOSPI added just 0.47%. Most regional exchanges were set to end the week marginally higher following an initial rally on bets that the Fed could pause its rate height cycle sooner than expected. Indian stocks rose on Friday with the Nifty 50 up 0.47%, but a severe rout in the shares of Adani Enterprises and its related firms continued. That stock plummeted 30%. On Friday to a near two-year low and was set to lose over 60% of its value this week. Adani's market losses swelled above 100 billion US dollars on Thursday, sparking worries about a potential systemic impact a day after the Indian Group's flagship firm abandoned its $2.5 billion stock offering. Another challenge for Adani on Thursday came when the S&P Dow Jones Indices said it would remove Adani Enterprises from widely used sustainability indices effective from the 7th of February, which would make the shares less appealing to sustainability-minded funds. In addition, India's National Stock Exchange said it has placed on additional surveillance shares of Adani Enterprises, Adani Ports and Ambuja Cements. However, Adani Group Chairman Gautam Adani 
is in talks with lenders to prepay and release pledged shares as he seeks to restore confidence in the financial health of his conglomerate, at least according to Bloomberg. The shot withdrawal of a Downey Enterprises share sale marks a dramatic setback for the founder, the school dropout turned billionaire whose fortunes rose rapidly in recent years, but have plunged in just a week after a critical research report by US-based short seller Hindenburg Research. Aborting the share sale sent shockwaves across markets, politics and business. Adani stocks plunged. Opposition lawmakers called for a wider probe and India's central bank sprang into action to check on the exposure of banks to the group. Meanwhile, Citigroup wealth units stopped making margin loans to clients against Adani Group securities. The crisis marks a dramatic turn of fortune for Adani, who has in recent years forged partnerships with foreign giants such as France's Total Energies and attracted investors such as Abu Dhabi's International Holding Company as they pursue a global expansion stretching from ports to the power sector. And in a shock move late on Wednesday, Adani called off that share sale as the stock route sparked by Hindenburg's criticisms intensified, despite it being fully subscribed just a day earlier. Adani may have started a confidence crisis in Indian shares, and that could have broader market implications, a senior market analyst at Swissquote Bank said. Adani Enterprises shares tumbled 27% on Thursday, closing at their lowest level since March 2022. Another group companies also lost further ground, with 10% losses at Adani Total Gas, Adani Green Energy, and the Downey Transmission, while Downey Ports and Special Economic Zone shed nearly 7%. Since Heidenberg's report on January 24th, group companies have lost nearly half of their combined market value. Downey Enterprises, described as an incubator of Downey's businesses, has lost $26 billion in market capitalization. And Adani is also no longer Asia's richest person, having slid to 16th in the Forbes rankings of the world's wealthiest people, with his net worth almost halved to $64.6 billion in a week. The 60-year-old had been third in the list behind billionaire Elon Musk and Bernard Arnault. His rival, Mukesh Ambani of Reliance Industries, is now Asia's richest person. Adana's plumping stock and bond prices have raised concerns about the likelihood of a wider impact on India's financial system. India's central bank has asked local banks for details of their exposures to the Adani Group, government and banking sources told Reuters on Thursday. The CLSA estimates that Indian banks were exposed to about 40% of the $24.5 billion of Adani Group debt in the fiscal year to March 2022. Dollar bonds issued by entities of Adani Group extended losses on Thursday, with notes of Adani Green Energy crashing to a record low. Adani Group entities made scheduled coupon payments on outstanding US dollar denoted bonds on Thursday, according to Reuters. We see the market is losing confidence on how to gauge where the bottom can be, and although there will be short covered rebounds, we expect more fundamental downside risk, given more private banks are likely to cut or reduce margins, said Monica Heiso, Chief Investment Officer of Hong Kong-based credit fund Trader Capital. In New Delhi, opposition lawmakers submitted notices in Parliament demanding discussion of the short seller's report. The Congress party called for a joint parliamentary committee to be set up or a Supreme Court monitored investigation, while some lawmakers shouted anti-Adani slogans inside Parliament, which was adjourned for the day. Adani made acquisitions worth $13.8 billion in 2022, Dear Logic data showed. That's the largest ever and more than double the previous year. The, the cancelled fundraising had been critical for Adani, which had said it would use the $1.33 billion to fund green hydrogen projects, airport facilities and greenfield expressways, and $508 million to repay debt in some units. Hindenburg's report alleged an improper use of offshore tax havens and stock manipulation by the Adani Group, and also raised concerns about high debt and the valuations of seven listed Adani companies. Now, the Adani Group has denied these rumours, saying the allegations of stock manipulation has no basis and stem from an ignorance of Indian law, and it said it always made the necessary regulatory disclosures. Now, here in Australia, financial markets are speculating whether the Reserve Bank's expected interest rate increase on Tuesday could be its second last act of policy tightening this cycle, as investors and central banks increasingly back the belief that inflation has peaked. Heading into 2023, economists' consensus was aligned at 
two cash rate increases this year, taking the peak reserve bank rate to 3.6%. But rate traders were more hawkish, projecting a peak of 3.8% at the time. We think the RBA will do one more in February by 25 basis points and then be finished for this cycle as signs of rate cuts working are evident. Retail sales down, house prices down, lending down, credit growth slowing and inflation indicators are all moving in the right direction, said Diana Musina, AMP's senior economist. Of course, the ECB and the Bank of England early on Friday raised their benchmark rates by 0.5 percentage points. That takes the ECP lending rate to 2.5% and the Bank of England to 4%. Australia's cash rate is 3.1%. And it's worth noting the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey described a turning of the corner of inflation and his confidence, which came with caveats, echoed that of Fed Chair Jerome Powell, who said earlier in the week, we can now say for the first time the disinflationary processes have started. The week of central bank action reinforced the current market theme that the rate hiking stage of this cycle is in its final stages, said Peter Dragovich, core pay currency strategist, who's formerly of Numura. That being so, inflation will require vigilance. These high levels of rates may need to stay in place for some time to be sure inflation washes out of the system, he added. So the Reserve Bank meets on Tuesday for the first time this year and markets are firmly counting on a 0.25 percentage point rise to 3.35 percent. The February meeting also marks an updated look at the Reserve Bank forecast from the forthcoming quarterly statement on monetary policy. Interest rate sensitive banking, real estate, tech and healthcare businesses led a share market rally on Friday to help shares post their third straight day of gains and finish just 1% shy of a record high of 7,632, which was back in August 2021. The Aussie slipped against the US dollar to 69.21, down 2.16%, and it was at 0.5742 against the pound, down 0.79%. Commonwealth Bank hit a record interest rate high of 111.43 ahead of its half-year earnings report due February 15th, with $151 billion healthcare giant CSL climbing 3% to a 52-week closing high of $313.81 after broker Morgan Stanley said December quarter sales from rival Japanese blood product business Takeda suggested a positive read. The local healthcare sector's 2.5% gain helped the benchmark ASX 200 index add 0.6% or 46 points to 7,558. For the week, the market firmed 0.9%. And on Friday, the real estate sector climbed 2.4% with industrial business Goodman Group rising 3.7%. Financials closed 1.2% higher. Hearing aid manufacturer Cochlear jumped 2.3% to finish up 9.4% year to date. And IAG Group shares dropped 2.1% after the insurer warned on costs from the severe Auckland flooding and cut its earnings guidance for the second time in nearly seven months. Australian two-year government bonds rose to 326 ahead of the Reserve Bank's monetary policy decision next Tuesday. And analysts and economists expect a quarter percentage point lift in the key overnight rate to 3.35%. But CBA's economics team says we believe there is a non-trivial risk the RBA raises the cash rate by a larger 40 basis points to 3.5% and also announces an intention to hold the policy rate steady over the period ahead if economic developments evolve broadly in line with their updated forecasts. And finally, in crypto, Bitcoin slipped back a bit following the broader markets to 23,396. While there was more bad news for accused fraudster Sam Banksman fried his emergent Fidelity Technologies an offshore entity that owns 55 million shares in Robinhood markets, filed for bankruptcy amid a fight over who should get the stock following the collapse of FTX Group. So if you stand back and think about all of the things we've been sussing, you can see here that, again, the cross-currents are pulling in multiple directions. But I do think it's very unlikely that the markets will follow through on these rises and there will be some significant stuttering as we go through this year and the risk of more falls later. So, in a way, Aaron is right. You've got to make a call based on where you think the markets are going to be and the risk appetite and where you perceive losses may or may not evolve. But the bottom line is this. 
Many in the markets are over bullish and are not just looking through the data appropriately to still see the weak underbelly. It's there for all to see. And sure, the apocalypse may have been postponed a bit, but there's still a significant risk that later those four horses reappear. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.